Hello, and welcome to Crusonia Conversations, where entrepreneurs, experts, and investors explore change in the global food system. I'm Sarah Mock, your host for today's discussion, which focuses on food and health in the time of COVID-19. The strengths and weaknesses of the food system have never been more in the spotlight than they are during the current global pandemic. From bare grocery store shelves and long lines at food pantries to empty restaurants and the diet-related diseases that have put individuals at greater risk for complications, could the new level of attention being paid to the food sector fundamentally change the way individual organizations, supply chains, and whole economies function as the current crisis abates? Now, to help us dig into those possibilities today, we're joined by Carter Williams and Tyler Cohen. Carter has spent his entire career working on innovation. A trained engineer, he took leadership roles at Boeing, managing R&D and starting Boeing Ventures, and has since become a successful entrepreneur and venture investor. Tyler Cohen is an American economist and professor of economics at George Mason University. He is author of the book, Stubborn Attachments, and hosts the economics blog, Marginal Revolution. Tyler is also a confirmed keynote speaker at the Crusonia on the Delta Forum. And speaking of Crusonia, to kind of kickstart this conversation, Tyler, I wonder if you can give us a little bit of context around that concept. What is Crusonia? The idea of a Crusonia plant is about dynamic, self-replicating value, where you keep on creating value in future periods. There's learning, there's production, there's economic growth. That's a Crusonia plant. Interesting. Now, Carter, talk to us a little bit about why that concept was kind of the right driver, the right idea to kind of be at the foundation of the forum that uh, and the conversation we're having today. It's just my experience that there's a role of an entrepreneur to step in, tackle challenges that somebody hasn't figured out before, and then simplify. Because, you know, an entrepreneur can figure that kind of stuff out better than a lot of people sitting in central command. And so we wanted to create that concept and the notion that all of us entrepreneurs are in here to do this. And in the first instance, we're trying to create new technology that solves a problem. In the second instance, it benefits everybody. In Absolutely. So many of those ideas around entrepreneurship will be so central to this conversation today. But we've got to start with kind of the, the, the headline topic today, which is coronavirus. And we're just seeing a, a shift in the food system. And now you put coronavirus on top I, you know sometimes when i think about technology i'm like okay what's gonna happen with covid it's gonna completely radically change things um or will it accelerate things like we were gonna change the food system maybe over the next 20 years but but now we're gonna change it in five years because the the value proposition change because consumers are coming out of the woodwork saying, I'm ready to change. And, and Tyler, this is a, you know, I'm always fascinated. I think you've covered it in a few of your books, your books in terms of flip the switch moments. And, and I sort of think of that in terms of there's some structural things going on that are causing people to shift their viewpoint. And then there's a spark or there's something else that, that triggers it. Sometimes it's a market force. And, and to some degree, I think a COVID is sort of, Hey, this fire was sort of set <laughs> and ready to go. It's just been accelerated in terms of like a massive sort of shift in how people think about food and what they eat. For the two of you, are there any historical moments for food or health that seem useful to remember right now and may give us some information about what the next steps might, might look like? Well, when America fought the Second World War, many resources, of course, were diverted to the war effort. And food habits really changed. People learned how to improvise, they rethought what they had been eating. I think we're going to see a similar trend. People are jolted out of their status quo bias, and they are rethinking everything about what they're doing with food. I'm also reminded of the era of prohibition. When alcohol was outlawed, that led to many restaurants being shut down because they weren't profitable anymore. So people had to eat at home more, Restaurants needed to reinvent themselves. Again, the details are very different from the current day, but the idea of a rapid major shock hitting food institutions. You talked about this shift from, you know, American restaurant culture pre-prohibition was around maybe up more upscale restaurants, kind of an alcohol culture, and then there was a shift to, to diner food or fast food or maybe these other players having a bit of an advantage. You know, thinking kind of high level even on that, 
there's a big difference between those two in terms of health and nutrition. Before prohibition, it was much less likely that people would take their children with them when they went out to eat. It was something you did apart from your children. Maybe the grandparents would watch the kids or someone else, a neighbor. Uh, but you don't bring your kids to a saloon, right? Not back then, especially. So once legal saloons are shut down, what entrepreneurs did was they thought, well, we can feed people. Uh, since it's not the atmosphere of a saloon anymore, we're going to put items on the menu to appeal to their children. And we know kids like food typically that is sweeter, easier to eat with your fingers. In some regards, the tastes are more superficial, also less strong. And American food does change in exactly those directions. And that persists throughout much of the post-World War II food era. I wouldn't say it's the world we're living in right now, but it's a major shock to American food. And elevating the role of children was the irreversible part of that change. The links between nutrition and health and susceptibility to the virus have not really been widely talked about in terms of evidence that individuals with diabetes and cardiovascular disease are more likely to suffer pretty severe impacts. Do you expect nutrition to be a bigger part of this conversation going forward? I think in terms of health today, we're at a very interesting moment. I think many people are making their diets much healthier and some making their diets much less healthy. So if you think of the new COVID-19 system, it basically encourages bulk ordering, bulk buying, and bulk delivery. And those foods can either be very good for you or very bad for you. Yeah. And I think we're seeing people go both ways. We would like to have nudges that more people do the healthier eating. Do people sort of say, I'm gonna eat better, I'm gonna change my social behavior, those could be an economic opportunity to buy differently but I'm also doing this because socially we've realized we got to take better care of ourselves. My personal view, not speaking as an expert in diet, but it seems to me obvious Americans consume far too much refined sugar and I think they should give it up as much as possible. I've tried to do that in my own life, I think mostly successfully. Uh, and I think just needing to mentally reach the tipping point where you say, yes, yes, I know, but now I'm going to do it. I would like it if we studied more how people get to that decision point. To what you understand, how does sugar consumption affect immunity and our health as a society? There's enough evidence that, that sugar, high degree of sugar, refined sugars, makes us more, more vulnerable to um, disease. Um, and we just gotta change that. Type two diabetes is I think the largest pandemic going on right now. <laughs> As a as a side note, um, and and nobody's paying attention to it. Um, that's sort of a interesting problem. Um, we spend one point six trillion dollars on food in the United States each year. We spend, I believe, it's one trillion on nutrition related wellness. I've been told by a health insurance company it's one point nine trillion. Those are just the U.S. numbers, and it's clear that cardiovascular disease, diabetes type two diabetes, and many cancers are tied to no nutrition issues. Prior to the pandemic, there have been major trends of people eating more fresh food and looking for really alternative protein sources. How is COVID affecting our appetites for those products now? So in the, in the equation of the shift of the supply chain and everything, the fresh is great, but it's got like a 40% waste stream. So 40% of what we consume on the fresh side somehow ends up in the garbage somehow. We bought too much lettuce, so it went bad. Now that's the extreme case. Um, so from an investor's standpoint, we're sort of staring at it. It's like, okay, can I eliminate waste somehow? Well, processed eliminates waste. That's the cool thing about it. We say we don't like ultra-processed food, but it really... It eliminates waste. If you eliminate waste, you eliminate cost. And if you're trying to satisfy the entire population, probably it's going to include some kind of shelf stability thing. So, I, I mean, we're right at this tension point of and, and trying to figure out that balance. What do entrepreneurs live on? Entrepreneurs live on information from customers. And, and we've just exploded this information channel of a whole bunch of different people looking for different things. 
And that's a perfect time for an entrepreneur to sort of step in and sort of sort, sort in a high echo kind of way, sort out all the noise of, of what, what's episodic preference and what's something, you know, is Tyler going to permanently change his behavior in a way that I can build a business around it? I found my food waste at home has virtually dropped to zero. It used to be fairly high, but the way it is now, let's say I order ground lamb from Whole Foods. I don't actually know when can I get ground lamb again? How many times do I have to click the refresh button before they'll give me a delivery window? So if I get two pounds of ground lamb, I assure you I use that two pounds very well. I don't throw any of it out. I hope this habit sticks with me. I think it will. Again, it's something I had to learn. And it's another example of being jolted out of the complacency of the earlier status quo. Training these new consumer habits around waste reduction and kind of increased efficiency, is that a fundamental kind of challenge to business models that, for better or worse, have probably built in some amount of consumer waste to their bottom line? From the entrepreneur standpoint, if people shift, like I did, I shifted into this mode that anytime I see waste, it bugs me culturally. Like, at my bare bones, it bugs me. Um, before 89, maybe I didn't think that way. But if the consumers change that way, that changes our equation on how we solve the food problem. I think there's a market opportunity for entrepreneurs to sell new food products where the non-wasteful way of using them is more transparent. I think people now want products where it's really very obvious. What's the right way to use this for how long? When is the, that yogurt you know, really bad? When is the cheese actually too sour or too moldy? And I think the market's going to deliver that much more rapidly than it would have otherwise. So I'm not sure people will just start eating something they've never heard of. But I see shifts in every part of people's diets going on right now. Is there an opportunity for new products right now? Or is the, the opportunity really here for established players? I think people are shifting what they do. I'm not sure they're moving to totally new products. But they want, say, a farm version of an old product. They want a more durable version of an old product. They want a version of an old product where they know how to cook it, or maybe it comes with instructions. So I'm not sure people will just start eating something they've never heard of. But I see shifts in every part of people's diets going on right now. Again, every meal of the day, every item they're buying. People are having to improvise, learn new cooking techniques. Uh, even sometimes grow things in their backyard. Growing something in your backyard, that's a very old food product, right? <laughs> still a big change for actual people. Are you seeing fine products that have not really pre-existed before? Am I making sense? I don't even know if they pre-existed. Uh, they were not on my radar screen. I suspect they existed. So I go to farmer's markets, uh, I'm not sure what was there before. I doubt if they're just full of completely new merchants, but they may have some. And the people I speak to who are doing farm to table food delivery, they have never been busier. So those are new products at the retail level, but they're not completely new products coming from nothing. Do you think delivery, the, the changes that we've seen to delivery around COVID right now will end up furthering the decline of kind of brick and mortar stores? Or do you think that there's a possibility that those kind of businesses will be able to leverage enhanced delivery for to, to grow or to recover some of the, the loss they've felt to digital alternatives? I think some brick and mortar stores will just go. Some others will be converted into partial warehouses, but still open for shoppers and others will thrive depending on how well they do delivery and just general speed of response. Um, I hope the delivery system survives because I think it allows a quicker information flow to entrepreneurs to change the system. It feels like it will. And I think that when you look at millennials and Gen Z, they, they operate in more of a 1099 mindset. We're a flexible workforce. And I get the sense that, that they're ready to provide their labor for that. So I, but the, the work from home flexible system allows entrepreneurs to react a lot quicker. Now, we've had a major shift in the economy towards home delivery in recent weeks. I wonder what you both think of how that response has been for everyone from retailers to consumers as that shift takes place. I think the quality of delivery lately has been remarkably high. 
Americans have shown trust in delivery, and I've ordered dozens of packages, not, not just food, of course, and everything I've ordered has been delivered and delivered well and delivered safely. And that's been one of the shining success stories, that the bravery and dedication of our delivery service people, I just think has been phenomenal. There is a, a, an issue of price, I think, in part of this equation as we think about it. Pressure we're under as investors is we got to make money on our investments and go after the things that are going to be durable changes. But as from a mission standpoint, we're trying to figure out how do we increase the nutritional profile and reduce cost? One of the things that was going on as we came into this whole episode was there was a war going on between the CPGs, like a Kraft and a Mars versus Whole Foods and Walmart, in which Whole Foods and Walmart were getting a lot of light and information from consumers about what they wanted. And they were starting to see through their data mining these preference changes. But the CPGs are the guys that sort of developed the products. So you have this separation between Walmart's got the information and the proximity to the, the customer's new needs, and the CPGs are, are removed from that conversation. And we were seeing a structural change start to go on where the retailers were more willing to go out and see the entrepreneurial product offerings. You saw that, like, um, it took a little bit of help, but um, when Beyond Meat, Beyond Meat was in the vegan counter for a while. And as soon as they, it was sort of one board meeting, someone said, well, why don't you stick that in the meat counter? So one of the board members at, at Beyond Meat is a, runs a, a, a grocery chain. And they flipped it over on the meat side and they saw, I don't know, 40x increase of demand once it was over in the meat section. It wasn't meat, but it but people wanted it. And and so the thing we don't know as investors is where's this shift occurring? And obviously as Tyler is representing here, his his needs are changing dramatically. At the bottom of the pyramid, I don't know what they're doing, but we were definitely seeing this shift. So where's the guy come from? I you know, where where the mindset it's gonna come from the retailers being more connected to the entrepreneur, new food development people, not to the old food development people, and probably more connectivity back to the farmer um, to try to disintermediate current supply chains. I mean, that's, that's where we're hunting in terms of where is that evolution occurring. And that's probably where we're going to see the signal for the new value being created. And I see the big advantage going to the fast responders. So this time, of course, the shock was a pandemic, and you needed to be ready to shift a lot of resources into delivery. Now, the next shock to come, it probably won't be another pandemic. It will be something else. You'll need to make some other kind of shift. But which institutions have really earned and mastered the art of speed and flexible rapid adjustment, I think over time will earn higher compound returns and keep on gaining market share. The links between nutrition and health and susceptibility to the virus have not really been widely talked about in terms of evidence that individuals with diabetes and cardiovascular disease are more likely to suffer pretty severe impacts. Do you expect nutrition to be a bigger part of this conversation going forward? I think it will. But right now, the health concern is so obsessively about COVID-19. and I don't think enough Americans know how much, say, having diabetes or hypertension increases the risk of COVID-19 itself. People are just learning that. I think when this is all over, that will be an enduring lesson. So this is something that vexes me because I, I look at the numbers and, and it's clear that food affects health. So we think that the, the cost of bad nutrition in the healthcare system, I think is somewhere between a trillion and two trillion dollars. And the amount of venture capital in the United States is 66 billion. The amount of high net worth wealth in the United States is 60 trillion. So the challenge we I see, the global challenge I see is how to get that 60 trillion dollars of high net worth dollars to basically say, Oh, cool. It's, it's cool that we're spending $66 billion over here in Silicon Valley working on media and entertainment and IT, but should we be spending $66 billion 
investing in Crisonians who are changing the food system so that we can take that trillion, $2 trillion of annual costs on nutrition related healthcare and make it 500 billion or, or whatever. I mean, that's the, that's the macro. I don't have the solution, but that's the macro challenge that I wake up with every day. I think one of the, the challenges on the healthcare system is we still see inflationary pressure. And so any market, my attitude is any market where you keep seeing inflationary pressure is a market that doesn't have enough innovation. I mean, that's sort of like a really top level viewpoint or you've got regulation in the way. Um, but it strikes me that there's, it's not going to stop. And, and the sort of rent seeking that goes on in the healthcare system to sort of stabilize it as it is, is not, good for patients in the long run. And we see a lot of innovation that it could help fix this. And it's hard to get it to market because of regulatory. And I just think we're hitting a break point. Is there an opportunity for more direct investment from the healthcare space in the food system to kind of create feedback loops that lower cost for healthcare over time? I think that, you know, I think about this at a system level and a local level is, you know, the local entrepreneur is producing something based off of ingredients. So one of the areas we invest more heavily in is ingredients. We've got one investment in a company named Banyamos that produces a sugar that has one-tenth the glycemic index of normal sugar. We've got sort of frontline, close to consumer and back office, you know, the ingredients that are going in. But if I were a health insurance company and I knew my prices were going up, honestly, I mean, I'd be investing in food technology just to to make that stuff more available, I would imagine that they should invest more in food. They're not. I mean, I've only run into some of them that are. So maybe they're not convinced yet. The other macro thing I pay attention to is that 60% of people make their buying decisions based on price, not quality taste. And the quality of our nutritional profile in the food system has declined over the last 30, 40 years. And so those are all the inputs that sort of say, at a macro level, something's got to change, but, but nothing's going to change. I think Tyler's mentioned this multiple times. So if you don't behavior at the front line has got to change because people deliver higher quality things that people want. And so the way to fix it is get enough innovation with the entrepreneurs that are close to customers in a high kind of way, trying to figure out what customers want, probably while also reducing price so that you get a behavior change. Um, and maybe with the pressure of COVID, there's other things that will come into that calculus. I think we need to make eating healthy more fun. And some of this is the taste, but some of it is the branding. But I'm struck whenever I visit India, 90% of what I eat is vegetables. And you know whether or not you think people should be vegetarians, but in India, it simply tastes better. So it is possible. I'm not sure how far we will get by lecturing people. But entrepreneurs who see that healthier eating can be better, more fun, better branded, taste better, or maybe taste not worse, that's where I think the money is and the future is. And I know it can be done because I've seen it done in other countries. Yeah. As a nation, we do eat worse overall. But the people who eat well, their health, actually are doing better than ever before. So the variance has gone up. So this country is showing that improvement is possible and indeed a reality, but getting more people into the bin of people eating more healthy is what we need to do. I do believe we can do it. It will save us billions of dollars, but it's not easy to accomplish. Just as the visibility of things like kind of conditions in slaughter plants or the condition of farm workers in America, the, the role of farm workers in our food system, do you think that just the change in perception there could be a, a trigger for greater change? Or do you think that that's just kind of a, a residue of the moment? I believe we will clean up many of our factories for producing foodstuffs. We will have to just to keep them up and running. And once those procedures are in place, some of them will just stay. Others regulators may insist upon. That's another good example of some changes that I think will be permanent. I think we are also bringing in more guest workers to work in the fields to make sure our food supply chain is not disturbed. Uh, we're sh seeing a shift in the composition of immigration. So uh, people who get high skill visas, that's now actually less popular politically 
and people you need to secure the food supply chain that's now much more popular politically. And that too, I think, will stick for a good while. There is also a, you know, if we go back to China, China was having a huge problem with a virus running through the swine system. And when you get, you get 100 miles past Beijing around China, what, how they manage the, the food system in terms of meats is pretty, uh, it's not great. <laughs> uh, and so if there's a lot of pressure on, ter- on China in terms of their ability to deal with husbandry and, and animals, um, people may not want to buy from China. China itself has to deal with the practical challenges of that. And if those swine don't eat, they're not going to need soy from the United States to feed them, which, and then with the energy, energy being free now, I guess, with oil, <laughs> there's not a lot of ethanol required. I mean, just sort of all these sort of shifts going on in the supply chain. What I'm seeing is that more and more countries don't trust global supply chains the way they used to. So for instance, Vietnam, cutting off most of its rice exports. Uh, You'll see more places producing more at home, and that will be major shift in every region of the world over time, and that's already underway. Because no one's sure if there's a crisis, the other countries will sell to them. Well, there could be two worlds. Vietnam will have its own. It will use CRISPR to duplicate GMO seeds, just like they used to copy DVDs. They'll just copy them over and generate its own product and be completely central. Um, it may sit within a supply chain of China and meet, go to produce the, their architecture, or it may, it may be like Pakistan adopted 3G cellular before anybody else because there was no installed base. What bellwethers should we be looking out for that will indicate a change in American food culture that could last for years to come? This healthcare connection with food you know, if we talk to people who are, if you're behind the scenes, if you talk to people that run health insurance companies, they say the only way to fix healthcare is to fix the food system. That there's a, there's a, there's no way that they can reorganize price enough in healthcare unless people get rid of type two diabetes, get rid of cardiovascular disease, and they got to do that by eating better. Over the medium to long term, the only way we can afford this pandemic is actually as a nation to eat better. And how we get there, how long it takes us, I think it's difficult to predict. Uh, When the impossible is what has to happen, actually it will happen. And I'm modestly optimistic about that longer term perspective. If you go back to the Corsonian standpoint, I think that, you know, connecting these two markets, uh, this is the thing on my mind. We, We are a market ourselves. As venture capitalists, we look at startups to invest in them and we go to capital providers and we say it's better to invest in us because we see an arbitrage here that nobody else sees. And the Cressonian idea is, is I'm going to bet on Robinson Crusoe more than I'm going to bet on some guy who's living on a bigger island because he's going he's gonna to see that arbitrage before someone else. So I see the opportunity. back to our uh, live Q&A. We're actually going to go now to our live audience here for questions. A few guidelines just here at the top. We're going to do our best to get to as many of your questions as possible. Uh, So just to ask a question, go ahead and type your questions into the chat function on Zoom or into the Q&A button that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. We will then read your name and your question uh, and get Tyler and Carter's feedback on it. So we will dive right in. We got a couple of questions that uh, folks asked during uh, the live interview. So we're gonna start with a question from Chris Thon, uh, who asked, how will the economic downturn drive more towards worse food choices or rather than uh, <laughs> as those are cheaper? So for example, a McDonald's hamburger can be afforded a lot more easily than a pack of Beyond Meat burgers. How are you guys conceptualizing that trade-off? I think with the downturn, a lot of people will simply stock up on junk food, and that will be bad for them. And when they go back to restaurants, they'll do drive through and drive through tends to be fast food. It's not that all fast food is bad for you, but a lot of it is, of course, and that can be the worst side of McDonald's. So that's the risk we run. We need to teach people better practices, and that teaching will be done by entrepreneurs 
responding to market incentives? So the the other aspect of this is it's it, there could be things we're doing right now with COVID that we're just doing to survive. Uh, there is some portion of the population that's probably having regular meals at home now and is buying ahead and sort of thinking twice about, hey, maybe I was doing too much ordering out and I'll do it in. So we'll, I think we'll see some shifts. I'm not positive we'll see a major shift from it, but uh, we could also see people say, you know what, I have been eating too much crappy food and I need to change and lose weight and do something after COVID. So I think people are being more introspective as a result of COVID. Uh, we have another question from David Hunt. He asked, do you both see an increasing drive towards automation of supply chains and processing as part of COVID recovery? And do you think investments will reflect that as well? I think food factories will automate more because they will be stung by possible liability suits or workers quitting or just bad public relations. So this will accelerate a trend that was already happening. I think also the future of immigration is somewhat in doubt, even though the Trump administration has just let in more food workers from Latin America. Longer term, people are not sure that will continue. And to the extent you're not sure you can hire the migrants you want, again, that's an incentive for greater and more rapid automation. So, so before COVID was coming on, we were seeing a shift in supply chain where um, uh, people like an Impossible Meat were starting to look up the supply chain and, and disintermediate around people like Cargill to think through their supply chain and how are they going to get better yellow pea. And so what we may be seeing is, you know, Cargill is an important player in the food industry. Amazon is becoming an important player in the food industry. Uh, as people have had to, there are a whole bunch of preconceived notions about how the industry needs to operate. And now under the pressure of COVID, my expectation is people will say, you know what, this preconceived notion that was holding us up from making this change was crap. It was a dumb idea. It's a, we can get rid of it. And so my expectation and something we've been looking for as investors is whether that shift is going on. I, we haven't done the census on it yet, but my expectation is people will realize that there's a shift and that the automation that will occur, the big automation challenge we have is, you know, uh, Cargill moving shiploads of corn is one thing. And how do you get it down to the point that they're moving smaller unit quantities? So we may see some shift there. But I think the signaling from the marketplace to try to figure out how to rebalance supply chain uh, that, that I would expect that somebody's going to step in there and uh, I'd still be long Amazon in this conversation because they're going to figure out how to automate that quicker than cargo. Interesting. Uh, in a good follow up from Ber Bruce German on that, actually, he asks, do you guys see a quote democratization of the fruits of innovation in the ag and food sector with the concentration of the of ag value into fewer and fewer winners he had some context around that historically farmers who owned land gained long-term financial stability because they own the land but by all accounts amazon will come away from covid with a significantly greater value um despite you know the the huge amount of risk being put on their workers um so yeah question being do you think, do you see more democratization of kind of the benefits of what comes out of um, the ag and food sector? I think thinly capitalized businesses right now are having difficulties across the entire American economy. And some of those shifts will be permanent. So the major tech companies, the major food suppliers and processors, are the ones that have the reserves and the talent to weather this storm. So they will come out of this stronger I'm not sure what you mean by democratization, but I would expect most of the major players, at least in relative terms, to be in a more dominant position, say, one or two years from now. Yeah, so the, when you look at folks like Amazon, again, they're getting a huge amount of information about where the opportunity is, and all signs are they're using that information for private purpose, uh, which may constrain the democratization of it. Uh, so I think, uh, I don't have a good answer on this. Bruce always asks tough questions, but I, I, I couldn't resolve it down to the democratization yet. I think that 
what entrepreneurs need to do is get as close to customers as possible to see where those trends are. Uh, folks like Amazon are always there first. So I, I, it's something we're watching, but I'm not sure. Christopher Greenwell has a question for you both. And he is wondering what is for both of you, the quote, I never thought that would happen event for food. And he says, for example, um, the economic crisis in 2009, we saw oil over a hundred dollars a barrel and now it's below twenty dollars. So is there anything, any event that's taken place that, you know, was was a kind of I never thought I'd see that in my lifetime moment in the in the food or ag space? Well, here here's the event for me. It hasn't quite happened yet. Uh, these days it is thinkable. And that is artificial meat becoming a significant thing in people's diets. It's still too expensive. A lot of people still think it's weird. I can easily imagine that happens well within my lifetime. And 10 years ago, I would not have thought that. Five years ago, I would have been skeptical. And now it's quite possible. I've, I've been surprised at how rapidly the restaurants have adapted. I Even a local restaurant is even doing drinks to go, uh, which I, I never in a million years would think that somebody would take out, order uh, a cocktail. So I, I've been surprised at how quickly the retailers have sort of flipped around. Um, and so I'm really intrigued about what that might lead to next. And we've constantly been worried, well, we've been intrigued about whether front end stores are gonna disappear. So I think, I think there's a lot more there about how retail is gonna change than we even imagined. And uh, that group of people who are trying to come back to work now I think are going to develop a whole bunch of unexpected innovations that may actually let front frontline retail compete against the power of somebody like an Amazon. But the jury's out. Uh, it, it's intriguing, but but no proof point yet. Moving right along with a question from Ed Rogers. Ed, I'm probably okay, but for other folks, on the off chance that I mispronounce your name, please uh, have patience with us. Um, but Carter, coming right back to you, what do you think it will take to get health insurers off the sidelines to invest in food as health companies or food as health VCs? And he adds, he followed up with the same question for pharmaceutical companies. It's, uh, this is the immediate question that, that we're looking at. You know, we, we ourselves, I select our investors and we want to bring those investors in to be capital providers. So it has been a daily thought on my mind. And I think it's a recognition, uh, finally recognizing that for them to protect themselves and for them to have a long-term competitive advantage, they have to step in and help people figure out how to change their healthcare. And they have to recognize finally that food is a direct component. Uh, we may see with some of the information out of COVID with diabetes and cardiovascular disease that they just become more attuned to the effect of, of COVID in that case. And so maybe more people inside of healthcare will realize it, but I, I myself want the answer to this question because I think the opportunity is there and I'm trying to figure out how to explain it. Uh, in Ed's case, Ed is actually the CEO of Banyamos, which I, we talked about earlier. Uh, and there's a real question out there as to whether healthcare should even step in and somehow subsidize better food. Uh, so the business model is there, but I don't, I don't know how to change, change their view yet. I think lower yields on government securities will accelerate this process. People will just be looking for higher returns They'll revise earlier investment plans, and they'll be looking to take more chances over time. You know, building on that, I think that the the nexus of the healthcare cost fix is food. So let's just say that's a truth. I I, I believe that's a truth. Um, the healthcare people maybe do not fully comprehend that yet, but the other truth is we haven't looked. I don't. Tyler may know. I don't know what where we'll be on debt versus GDP after this, but we'll finally be over that 100% mark. And I don't even know how that's gonna roll through the discussion. Six months from now, we're gonna be talking about that being 150% of GDP. And we've never been there before. And 
and they're I I have I mean we're just a new land and territory there. I I don't even know what that looks like, Tyler. I, I what does that look like <laughs> policy wise? What does that look like? Well, keep in mind, personal and corporate debt likely are going up as well quite a bit. So it's not just government debt. If it were only the government, it would be easier to deal with. So I think medium term, even when the health problems are cleared up, there's a very good chance of a balance sheet recession that in essence, people are borrowing against future earnings to get through the current day. And we're going to have to pay that off over time. So that could take us a number of years. It will be very painful. So on in, in the nexus of the argument around stock buybacks, so if we talk about stock repurchases and ad, admission by the CFO and the company that they've looked at R&D, there's no reason to invest in R&D. They've looked at competition, there's no reason to buy an acquisition to protect against competition. And so let's return capital to shareholders in some tax efficient way. That's sort of the decision being made. Now, because the interest rate was so low, they said, well, let's use our balance sheet to take on debt and buy back stock. So there's a little bit of financialization going on there. But the reality is, is they're waking up and they're saying, okay, we can't do any more debt. We can't increase our price of our stock uh, by, by this financialization. Um, the federal government is going to hit a point where I don't are they going to take it to 200% of GDP? I, I don't even, I mean, it just seems like you're going to hit a, a wall on that side. So maybe the answer to Ed's, Ed's question is, is all the routines, should we socialize medicine? Should we monetize the debt more? Should we use new monetary theory? All that stuff will be talked about, but someone will basically say, I got my business is, you know, I'm big co healthcare insurance company and I'm going to go out of business unless I deliver some new value here. And at that point, they may look at their internal group and say, can you guys come up with any new innovation? And sort of, they might realize the point and say, uh, no, we don't know what to do. And at that point, maybe that'll be the pressure point where they have no other choice. And they go back out and they start saying, we got to amp up our innovation. And the innovators are all out there spread amongst the venture community and it's time to go chase those people down because they've got better answers. I'm going to sneak in here really fast because that was a great segue to uh, I'm going to I'm going to merge a question from Dan Maycock and a follow up from Bruce. Dan asks uh, about food preferences and I know Tyler touched on this in, in his comments earlier but he wants to know what can be done to steer customers in a new direction away from salt sugar and chemicals and I'm going to ask part of Bruce's question as well because he asks um, you know, the challenges in scaling usually lead to, you know, automation and scale tend to make foods the way you described earlier, cheap children's foods that are simple and not particularly healthy. So is there a way to make, you know, is there a, a healthy, enjoyable, fun food that that scales or is that kind of the, the, the infinite challenge here that no one has really been able to, to answer? Well, right now, people are being pushed away from restaurant meals. And those tend to have more salt, sugar, and chemicals. People are learning to cook again, often using YouTube. Uh, I hope much of this sticks. And I think a lot of what pe many people are eating now is healthier food. Not everyone, but if you ate healthy food to begin with, you're probably moving right now in a healthy food direction. So the positive case scenario is people take what they're learning now and they internalize it and they keep maybe, say, half of it. I don't think there's a single mystery food that will be the next big thing. If you eat a diverse diet in moderation and don't overdo it and don't have too much junk food, not too much refined sugar, your chance of eating a pretty healthy lifestyle is quite good. So I think over time, we will see more people moving into that category. And the health risks of not being that way, of course, right now are much higher. That will help. So we we've had a supply problem here for a long time. So uh, I think we come out of the factory at birth wanting tasty, healthy, nutritious food. And then as we think about our scale and availability, we don't, we don't have access to it. And so globally, we've been, we spent the last 40 years trying to end starvation 
and to end starvation that was scale calories and corn soy monsanto improving yield to reduce cost so customers want better taste but they can't get it because it's too expensive or they don't have access to it you know if they're in a faraway land the 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 point that of innovation that we are seeing right now. And so as venture capitalists, we see things 10 years before everybody else does. We look at a thousand companies each year. So I'll, I'll say I've been to the promised land and I see it coming, but the whole pile of innovation that's coming forward is uh, along the lines of how do we improve nutritional profiles? How do we improve taste? So when we look at a tomato, Tomatoes have been engineered to be in a supply chain for three weeks and still be edible. If you take a tomato and eat it fresh, it's unbelievable, but that's because it has sort of more sugar content in it. And we bred that out. So if we can, so if we can innovate supply chains and make them shorter and we can genetically improve the quality of that tomato and reduce its price, people will eat the tomato. Be, they'll eat it because they want to, but you got to fix price and you got to fix the quality of that product. And I, how it will come about exactly, um, as Tyler says, it's, it's uncertain, but I can tell you 100% true, all that technology is piled up with entrepreneurs right now and working its way to market. We thought it might take five years to get it to market with back pressure right now on this food supply chain we might see it come to market in two years. And the difference is really bringing, putting a you know $60 billion of venture capital into this market is, is will accelerate it. We just have time for a couple more questions, but I wanted to get to Robert Levine's uh, question. He asks, how do you balance, from, from an investment perspective, how do you balance health versus resiliency objectives? And then his second, his follow-up to that is, and is there kind of a threat um, of a food crisis with with COVID nineteen with COVID nineteen right now. Well, on the investment side, I'm not a venture capitalist. I'm a private individual. My optimal strategy is to diversify because I don't, in general, know exactly which companies are going to be the winners. So I think you have to evaluate your own state of knowledge and your own portfolio to answer that one. Probably a lot of you out there to diversify much less. And what I do. In terms of the food supply chain, I do think we will make that manageable. Uh, I see a lot of scare stories in the press. In a lot of cases, what you simply need is for, say, the price of meat to go up. Consumers will buy less. It will be possible to pay workers more. So unless we shoot ourselves in the foot with bad public policy, I think we will keep most of our food supply chain up and running pretty much under all scenarios. And if you look at other countries that have been through this, including China. China's had massive problems. Their food supply chain did not collapse and it is less sophisticated than ours. Yeah, our food supply chain is amazingly robust and uh, there's some practical challenges. If you eat less hamburger, uh, what do you do with a hamburger that's coming off the, the steer or that's going to steaks? I mean, there, there's a certain balance of the system that we're probably seeing a uh, an imbalance right now, which is why they're slaughtering and throwing away some food. But uh, I, I'm pretty comfortable that our supply chain in the U.S. and the global supply chain is it's fairly robust. We'll see some stockouts. Um, my hope is that people recognize that the sophistication of that supply chain and, and think harder about how to use that strategically to bring more innovation to market. Because I, I think there's pent up demand for higher quality, better nutritious food. Speaking of pent up demand, uh, I have a couple of questions from Al Eisen and one from Tonya Weathersby. Um, Al asks, how do you see the current crisis driving poverty numbers and, and hence kind of the choice of food consumption? And then Tonya's good follow up to that is how can entrepreneurs reach those populations that are already struggling to buy healthy food even before COVID-19 became an issue? But in terms of reaching new populations, I think virtually everyone in America is rethinking how they buy their food and what they buy. It's no guarantee they will buy any particular new product, but there's never been a better time to get people to rethink because they're rethinking anyway. 
status quo and inertia buttons are turned off in a way I have not seen in my lifetime for just about everything. So I think it will be possible for entrepreneurs to get a lot of people, including people in food deserts, in poorer neighborhoods, uh, to change their food habits. Yeah, the, look, ultimately every entrepreneur needs to face the challenge of reducing costs while improving quality. That will cause a tipping point. Uh, and I think that we've got heightened awareness and I, I don't know whether that will flip the switch in people's minds, but I think from an innovation standpoint, the entrepreneurs that are more likely to win are the ones that are gonna reduce, improve quality and reduce cost at the same time. And, and that's, that's, that's the way you gotta go. I have a question here from Olga. Uh, she asked, with COVID-19 forced plant closures, a topic that's very timely, uh, and now forced openings, what do you think expenditures on quality and safety equipment will look like for large food processing corporations? Uh, I think they need to be much higher. I think they will be higher. The best thing we could do is allow the prices of some of these meats to go up. But the people, if they substitute out of pork, into something else, you know, say it's grass-fed beef or say it's beans, whatever they care to eat, uh, that's the market adjusting. And over time, companies will solve the problem of making those workplaces safer. Uh, but in the meantime, we should produce less of those things. Again, that's how markets work. My only fear is that the government stops or limits the prices from adjusting. But if the prices are free to adjust, it's a problem we will deal with okay. So we've been going back through our portfolio and asking all of our portfolio companies that they learned something new about their business as a result of COVID. And the answer is all of them have seen um, a shift. So for example, one of our companies who's been out raising money and talking to a lot of partners has found that because they don't have to travel, because of Zoom, because of communication, they're able to reach the CEO is now able to directly reach the partner and have a high bandwidth conversation about change. And as a result, every single one of them has found an advantage in COVID. So now let's take it back to the food system and slaughterhouses and such. We have had an issue of unresolved uh, bacteria and food safety issues and recall issues that have sort of wandered through the industry. And my guess is that half of that problem is past practice and not changing past practice. So my hope and the thing we're looking for is that when people think about better protection, that it will actually shift the business system where they sort of understand the total cost of this issue. And that in so doing, they come up with a more effective uh, meat processing and how they handle it in a fashion that kills two birds with one stone. One, it brings workers back, but two, they understand new productivity gains from these that actually enhance, enhance the quality of their product. We have time for about two more questions and I'm gonna jump in with one from Tanya Stewart. She asks, what role do you both think vertical farms or urban farms will play uh, in a solution to kind of the food issues we're facing right now. And I'm gonna add in uh, kind of local or regional food systems, farmers market CSAs. What kind of role do you think that kind of um, less centralized, smaller entrepreneurship will have as the food system shifts and continues to shift? Well, I'm hopeful on that one. I don't think we know yet, but it does seem to me that the market for a lot of office space in major cities will be quite weak for a long time. and. Uh, that means lower prices. So people will use those lower prices to experiment a lot. Will so much vertical farming in major cities stick? Uh, personally, I'm not sure. I think it's gonna have its big moment, its chance. So we once looked at the, I'm in St. Louis and we looked at the St. Louis Mall um, in which actually is declining in, in attendance. And we, it's 1.5 million square feet. And if you put vertical farming in there, you could grow leafy greens that would meet all the regional needs for leafy greens in St. Louis on an annual basis. So that's the size of footprint in a sense. You would build it differently, but but the if we're talking about better nutrition, better taste, that means we got to shorten supply chain. The best way to shorten supply chain is vertical farming. 
and that regionalization. I think we have seen a major pressure point in the U.S. food system to move all uh, leafy grains east of the Mississippi to more of the local production. And I think that retailers are going to start, maybe they were being sold by uh, uh, indoor farm leafy grains and they couldn't quite get the price point right. And I think that they now, the local retailers may be starting to get a better perception of what that means as a result of, of COVID. Uh, but I practically the right way to fix the food system, deliver higher quality, nutritious, lower cost food in the long term is indoor farming more locally developed. The, the exact architecture isn't sure, but that's, we're on that roadmap. And it's a matter of just getting the prices down before it, it becomes mainstream. And I think we're going to see that accelerate as a result of COVID. East coast of the Mississippi in particular. Uh, a question from Lucas Fry that I think is particularly interesting to, to think on the, the economy-wide impacts or, or scale here. He asks, with COVID and people leaving high rent inner city life, even temporarily, what is your over under odds on a longer term rural migration with uh, remote work mainstreaming and better rural internet connection than even 10 years ago. Could it be a cure for the kind of decline of inventiveness in the, the heartland that folks like Peter Thiel have uh, bemoaned in the past? What's the what's your guys' over under on, on a rural revival from COVID-19? I would bet on a revival in many suburbs. I'm not sure about rural areas, which tend to be fairly old and may have been depopulating for over a hundred years. But what you would call near rural suburbs that have a lot of space, but still have good hospitals, still have a good shopping mall. I think a lot of people will be moving out of center cities and into areas where social distancing is easier. I'm long Midwest, short Silicon Valley, New York. Uh, we're just going to ask one last question of from uh i'm going to take moderator's prerogative here and go ahead and ask myself so um so we're you guys obviously don't have a crystal ball but from your knowledge of kind of past flip the switch moments how do you believe this time will change the food system and how has how do you think it's changed kind of already in in this short period of time that we've we've been in the last six weeks well i would say the biggest change we've seen is simply so much of a move toward delivery, and then longer term, a collapse of globalized food chains. And I think both of those trends will stick to some extent, not entirely, not as radically as we're seeing them now. Uh, I think it's quite possible COVID-19 goes down as the biggest event in my lifetime. Uh, so it's a big deal, and it's gonna affect many facets of our life. It's already affected our food lives, we need to think how we as consumers, entrepreneurs, can use this terrible tragic moment, but also create opportunities from it and figure out there are some things we can do better. There are some things we can do right. Again, getting shifted out of the status quo bias into innovating. And this is a true flip switch moment. This is our chance finally to get it right. Let's manage to do that. Yeah, I think Tyler has nailed it. I think that we're going to see on the consumer side demand for for different choices. And I think that entrepreneurs are going to find it easier to bring new product to market and and accelerate that change that was already in work. Absolutely. Well, thanks again to both Tyler Cohen and Carter Williams for joining us here today and for being part of the conversation around coronavirus and the future of food and health. A big thank you to our partners, and we'd like to remind everyone to join us again on May 27th for the next Crusonia Conversation, our second of five digital broadcasts. You can register for that event by going to crusonia.org, and don't forget to tell a friend.